Second Corinthians, we'll be going through it uh, verse by verse, the Lord willing, and it'll be helpful if you have your, your own copy of the Bible with you. Let's begin in verse 1, and we'll read just through the first 11 verses this morning. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints who were in all Achaia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us you also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Much of scripture, as many of you know from experience, is not easy sailing for us as we attempt to read it. If you've ever attempted to read the Bible cover to cover, you may have found a steady wind and smooth sailing through Genesis, but you hit some rough seas of archaic civil laws in Exodus, and perhaps even stranded your ship on a ceremonial sandbar in Leviticus. At that point, some people, I suspect, hop a speedboat for the island of Psalms, or steer directly to the lighthouse at Proverbs Point. Some may even cruise all the way to Gospel Cove. But when we come to Paul's letters to the Corinthians, we come to a portion of Scripture to which we can easily relate, perhaps in part because our culture is so much like theirs, and perhaps because the letters, particularly 2 Corinthians, reveal so much of the personal struggles of the Apostle Paul, and we can all relate to a brother or sister with personal troubles. It was about 18 months ago that we completed a series taking us through 1 Corinthians. And uh, <clears throat> interestingly, and quite by uh, coincidence, uh, uh, historians believe that Paul wrote 2 Corinthians about 18 months after he wrote 1 Corinthians. So it's, it's a fitting time then for this study. As we prepare to set sail through 2 Corinthians, let's pause for a few minutes to, to get our bearings. Corinth, as you may remember, was an ancient city of Greece located about 45 miles west of Athens on an isthmus, that is a narrow strip of land connecting two larger land masses. Just as on a, on a map, southern Italy looks like a huge boot, southern Greece looks like a huge hand with fingers stretching out into the Mediterranean Sea. Corinth then would be on the wrist of the hand. Uh, connecting uh, the Adriatic Sea on the west to the Aegean Sea on the east. Uh, Corinth was a center of commerce then between Asia and Europe. Corinth presided over the Isthmian Games held every two years in which all Greek city-states participated. It became for a time a chief city, perhaps the chief city of Greece in wealth, literature, arts, and luxury. But Corinth fell to the Romans about 150 BC. The city was raised with a Z, that is a bad kind of raising, and the population was sold, territory was confiscated, and it remained vacant for about a century, but was refounded by Julius Caesar as a Roman colony. 
It quickly became a, a prosperous city once again with, and with prosperity came a reputation for sexual license. Charles Hodge says, of all the cities of the ancient world, Corinth was most notorious for licentiousness. At the highest point in the city stood the great temple of Aphrodite, Venus to the Romans, the goddess of love. The statue, the cult statue of Aphrodite, depicts her in the armor of the war god Ares, or Mars, with his helmet as a footrest and his shield as a mirror, suggesting the victory of love over war. But the love that made Corinth so popular was not what we would call agape love, sacrificial, selfless, pure, but eros, purely physical. The temple of Aphrodite was staffed by 1,000 female slaves dedicated to her worship. And we can imagine that Corinth became a popular port for sailors from Europe and Asia and a center of disease and debauchery for the ancient world. Paul arrived in Corinth on a second missionary journey just after his visit to Athens. You can read about it in Acts 18. After ministering there for a year and a half, he departed in, in what scholars believe was about 52 AD, or about 20 years after Christ's resurrection. A few years later, Paul wrote what we call 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, as you recall, is a strong letter in which he rebukes the believers for abuses and errors that had crept into the church. For, since the time that he founded that church. There were divisions. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. Christians were dishonoring the Lord by uh, hauling one another to court uh, before unbelievers instead of resolving issues themselves. Paul said, why do you not rather allow yourselves to be defrauded? Wouldn't that be preferable to going before unbelievers and dishonoring Christ? There was a misuse of gifts in Corinth, you remember, with too much emphasis placed upon those gifts which would draw most attention to the one exercising the gift, and too little emphasis placed upon edifying or building up one another. There was an abuse of the Lord's Supper in Corinth, so that when Corinthians came to the Lord's table and to the communal meals or love feasts, which apparently accompanied the Lord's Supper in Corinth, Believers were partaking unworthily, is the way Paul puts it. Some were hungry, some were drunk, some were rudely rushing to eat before others could be served. They were, in short, disdaining God's holy ordinance. Fifthly, there is reason to believe, because of Paul's strong words against sexual immorality and his warning the Corinthians against union with prostitutes, that some of them had embraced the Greek concept that succumbing to the desires of the flesh cannot affect the life of the spirit. There was even a case of sexual immorality in the church of Corinth that was unheard of, Paul says, among the Gentiles, that a man was in an incestuous relationship with his own father's wife. The church evidently accepted and embraced this man even as he continued in his sinful lifestyle. On top of all that, false apostles had come to Corinth casting doubt upon Paul's apostleship so that in both 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Paul is forced to defend his office by recounting his credentials. The most recent scholarship suggests the following order of events. Paul visits the church in about 52, 53 AD. He writes to the church a letter that's now lost. He refers to it in 1st Corinthians chapter 5. He writes 1st Corinthians, what we call 1st Corinthians, in the spring of 55. And then he makes a visit, what he calls a painful visit, coming to them with sorrow. He refers to that in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 1. Then he writes a severe letter to them. 2 Corinthians 2, 4 refers to it. We'll see it as we study. And then he writes this letter, 2 Corinthians, scholars think in about autumn of 56 AD. Now let's begin to look at the letter itself. And I'm reading from the New King James Version, uh, which is the one that, that I typically preach from. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the uh, salutation. Uh, today we would say, uh, dear so-and-so, putting our own name uh, at the top as, as a return address. At least that's what we used to do when we wrote and mailed letters to one another. The Greek style of Paul's day, uh, which he uses here, was to state the author and the recipient and send a greeting. Paul to so-and-so, 
and then the greeting. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. An apostle is literally one who was sent. Uh, he uses the term, however, in its highest sense. It is not Paul and Timothy, apostles of Christ, but Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Having had his, his uh, authority as an apostle challenged by some in Corinth, it's not surprising that he should begin by reestablishing that authority and declaring that he was not an apostle of the church, not an apostle from men who received his authority by men. He was an apostle of Christ Jesus, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. You remember in his letter to the Galatians, he began, Paul, an apostle not from men, uh, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, Paul didn't desire or require human authority for his ministry. Do we need, as some others, letters of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? 2 Corinthians 3. He was called by Christ. He was ordained to be his apostle. He wasn't an apostle of men. He was an apostle of God. To be an apostle in its highest sense, one had to have seen the risen Christ and to have been personally appointed by Christ. Paul saw the risen Christ on the Damascus road. He was Christ's chosen vessel to bear his name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Acts 9.15. So when it's used in its formal sense or highest sense, there are no more apostles on the earth. And there has not been an apostle on the earth since the close of the first century. But the term is also used simply to designate one who is sent. It's used that way in the Bible. In that sense, a missionary can be an apostle of a church. Barnabas, who was sent with Paul on Paul's first missionary journey, is called an apostle in that sense in Acts 14. In the same way, today we call groups like, uh, I don't know if they're still around anymore, but uh, when I was younger there was a group called Up With People who would uh, travel around singing and, you know, and, uh, and then we have uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders and we have Peace Corps volunteers and uh, in common vernacular we call them uh, ambassadors of goodwill for the United States. But we know that they're not ambassadors in the formal sense, appointed by the president to head U.S. embassies on foreign soil. Just like the original 12 apostles, Paul was called and separated unto his task by Jesus himself. In that sense, he was an apostle in the formal sense of the word. The main difference being Paul was called late, after the resurrection, as one born out of due time. That's how he puts it. This opened him up to attack by false apostles who resented Paul's authority. Where does he get this authority? Who made him an apostle? So Paul opens his letter, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. One commentator says it's not to share the responsibility of composition that Paul includes Timothy in the address, but to enhance Timothy's appeal to the Corinthians. Paul honors Timothy by including him in the salutation to the church of God, which is at Corinth. The Corinthian church had its problems, but it was still the church of God. With all the saints who were in all Achaia, Paul says, he anticipated that this letter would be circulated and read not just by the Christians in the city of Corinth, but by Christians throughout southern Greece. Notice he says, with all the saints who were in all Achaia. You don't have to read far in the New Testament to discover that the common concept of saint is not shared by Scripture. The Church of Rome, as you know, has done much to muddy the waters on this matter. They've developed a long, involved process of, for elevating someone to sainthood. But in Scripture, a saint is a sinner who has repented of his sins and placed his faith not in the church, not in sacraments, not in prayers or penance or papal pronouncements, but in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. It's an irony of history that the world has millions of living, breathing saints walking around at any given moment. There are a number of them seated before me now, but relatively few that will be recognized as saints by the church and then only after their death. And a significant number of those so designated may have been so misled by the false teaching of the church that they never understood or experienced salvation by faith alone. And so they never were saints, saints, they never were saints in the biblical sense, which, by the way, is the only sense that really matters. What does Paul wish for these saints in Corinth? Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul replaces the customary all hail of Greek letters with grace, grace, the free unmerited favor of God, and peace, the result of grace. Uh, 
I have peace in my heart, and I have peace with God because of the grace that God has bestowed upon me. Peace is the result of grace. From whom does this grace and peace come? From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul affirms the equality in the Godhead by coupling both persons in the very same invocation. Verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Eulogetos, uh, eulogy, to speak well of. Uh, Hodge says it expresses gratitude and adoration. Adored be God, in other words. It's the expression of highest veneration and thankfulness. Adored be God. He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God who's revealed himself as the God of love in sending his own son for our redemption. And then Paul goes on to call him the Father of mercies. That is the most merciful Father. He whose characteristic is mercy. Uh, Psalm 86, 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. In verse 15 of Psalm 86. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy. Remember Daniel's prayer from Daniel 9. He prays to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. And Micah speaks of him who delights in mercy, Micah 7, 18. God delights in mercy. He's the father of mercies. Now, it's, it's true that he's the creator of mercy. He's the father of mercy in that sense, as Satan is the father of lies. But here, I think the phrase refers to the fact that he's characterized by mercy. He's the, the God of mercy. Mercy characterizes him, the most merciful father, you might say. Furthermore, he's the God of all comfort. Now, as you read uh, the first chapter of 2 Corinthians, this comes across over and over again. Paul's use of the word comfort. Ten times in five verses, he uses the word for comfort or consolation. And if you read this uh, passage in its context, we did a, a bit of that by reading to verse 11 in our scripture reading. You'll see that Paul's writing about himself when he says, we, he's using what we would call today the editorial we. Uh, verse 6, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation. We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble. We despaired even of life. He's talking about the troubles that he underwent. And he uses the we in the, in the same way that a pastor might say we preached on this passage several months ago, when to be precise, he is the one who preached on it. So Paul speaks of our trouble which came to us in Asia, when in fact it was his trouble which came to him in Asia. But the use of the first person plural also makes it easier to apply these verses to ourselves. God who comforts us in all our tribulation. Now the skeptic will view this whole business of God's comfort of believers as mere foolishness. Christians imagine that they are going to be comforted by God because they are primed to expect it, and so they imagine that it occurs. It's no different, the skeptic would say, from clinical trials of new medications when a significant percentage of those receiving placebos, that is, pills with no active ingredients, report improvement, simply because they think that the pills are real and they're hoping or expecting for improvement. This is why, by the way, when I need a medication, I ask my doctor to just give me a placebo. It works much of the time, and there are no side effects, other than idiocy, you might say. My wife claims that I can't blame that on those pills. You Christians, the skeptic would say, you Christians think that God is comforting you because you expect God to comfort you. Well, what do we mean when we say God is the God of all comfort? Exactly how does God comfort us? Well, first he comforts us by bringing to our minds certain truths from his faithful word. He reminds us, for example, of his love for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. At a PCA church we attended while we were away, uh, 
an RUF uh, pastor who spoke told uh, this story. He said uh, the captain of a sailing vessel, this is back in the 1700s, uh, had his fiance on board. I guess she wanted to see you know, what it was he, he did. And uh, there was a huge storm, and the ship was buffeted, and, and uh, rains were pelting the captain, and she went up on the bridge and, and saw her fiance there, and she cried out to him, aren't you terrified? Aren't you terrified? Is, in other words, is this the kind of job you have all the time? Aren't you terrified? And he, he drew his sword in a threatening, and held it before her in a threatening manner. And he said to her, are you terrified? In other words, terrified of me holding the sword. She said, no. And he said, well, why not? He said, because I know the heart behind the hand that holds the sword. The Christian is comforted in tribulation because he knows the heart behind the hand of God's providence. He's fully persuaded that God loves him and that no affliction can separate him from God's love. Secondly, God comforts us by reminding of his vigilant care for us. It's comforting to know he loves us, but there are people that we love that we cannot always protect. We can't be always vigilant. But he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. Psalm 121. Even the most loving, most diligent human parent must sleep, must work, is distracted, but the believer is never outside God's loving care. Thirdly, God comforts us by reminding, of, reminding us of his awesome power. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ, saying, let us break their bonds asunder, cast away their cords from us, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold him in derision. Not only does God love us, he's all powerful. The Christian takes comfort in that. God comforts us by reminding us of his sovereignty over even seemingly chance events. Uh, Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. He comforts us by reminding us that he can turn evil into good for us. He comforts us by reminding us that he can turn evil into good for us. We know that all things work together for good to them that love him, to them who are the called according to his purpose. In 17th century uh, England, no doubt Satan believed he had won a minor victory when John Bunyan was in prison for preaching the gospel. But during those 12 years of solitude in the Bedford jail, he conceived and wrote the book which would be published and distributed, it is said, more widely than any other work of man or woman, Pilgrim's Progress. It gives us comfort in our trials and afflictions to know that the unseen hand of providence is at work and things that are not necessarily good in and of themselves, he works together for good in the lives of his covenant children, those who love God and are called according to his, pur his purpose. Sixthly, in a, in a similar vein, God comforts us by teaching us that afflictions tend to sanctify us. It's a comfort to me to know that whatever affliction may come in my life, God uses that to sanctify me. Every branch that bears fruit, my father prunes, Jesus said, that it may bear more fruit. John 15. Now, you may not see it. You may not uh, sense it during the pruning process. But the Father's purpose is that you would, through that painful process, bear even more fruit, bring him even more glory. Martin Luther's wife, Katie, said, I would never have known what such and such things meant in such and such psalms, such complaints and workings of spirit. I would never have understood the practice of Christian duties had not God brought me under some affliction. It's when the vine dresser anticipates no more fruit from the vine for that season, that he ceases to trim it and prune it. He allows the weeds to grow up around it. He leaves it alone, for further effort would bear no fruit. And think about this. Seventh, if you're keeping track, in an odd way, God even comforts us by reminding us of our sin. That is, he reminds me that the worst that could happen to me here is far less than what I truly deserve. 
The wages of sin is death. If God treated me with justice alone, apart from his mercy, I would have perished the first time I shouted no to my mother or threw the bottle across the crib. The old wooden cribs we had in those days. I guess we still have them. And if we step further back and widen the lens, God would have been perfectly just to have ended the lives of our first parents when they blatantly disobeyed his one restriction, clearly given. And they ate of the one tree in the garden that he told them not to eat of. You see, everything from that point on has been mercy, has been grace, has been, and every heartbeat of every believer has been a heartbeat of mercy. Every heartbeat of everyone has been a heartbeat of mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Psalm 130, verse 3. So, what does that mean to me? It means if I'm struck down by leukemia at the age of 30, or cancer at 40, or heart disease at 50, or something at 60, then the way I should view it is, God graciously gave me 30, or 40, or 50, or 60 years to serve Him, to live for Him, to enjoy the blessings of earth. 50 or 60 years that I had done nothing to earn, and that in fact, because of my sin and the sin of the first Adam, I did not deserve. Deep in the dust before thy throne, our guilt and our disgrace we own. Great God, we own the unhappy name whence sprang our nature and our shame, Adam the sinner. At his fall, death like a conqueror seized us all. A thousand newborn babes are dead by fatal union to their head. But whilst our spirits filled with awe, behold the terrors of thy law, we sing the honors of thy grace that sent to save our ruined race. We sing thine everlasting Son, who joined our nature to his own. Adam the second from the dust raises the ruins of the first. Isaac Watts. Eighth, God comforts us by reminding us that those who've gone before have suffered in similar ways. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Others who've gone before have suffered similar things. Uh, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, 1 Peter 4. There's no trial you can possibly face here that hasn't already been faced by others. And God promises that he will, with the trial, also provide a way for you to bear it. God is faithful. He will not allow us to be tempted above what we are able, but he will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Ninth, the Lord comforts us by reminding us not only that others have endured similar trials and glorify God in the midst of them, but that some of God's children have endured much more than we have. The Lord records for our encouragement and edification the trials of Joseph, the trials of Daniel, the trials of David, the trials of the Apostle Paul, trials of Job. Tenth, the Lord comforts us by reminding us that when we suffer, we are in a spiritual sense sharing in Christ's sufferings. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ, Paul said, verse 5. Paul told the Philippians that he longed to know the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, being conformed to his death, Philippians 3.10. In effect, when we suffer, we can commune with Christ more fully. Think about this, Christian. When we suffer, we can commune with Christ more fully as we receive a taste of suffering ourselves and are thus enabled to meditate with more understanding upon the sufferings that he endured for us. Eleventh, eleventh, the Lord comforts us by reminding us that our afflictions are temporary. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Spurgeon wrote, there's a limit to affliction. God sends it and then he removes it. Do you sigh and say, when will the end be? <coughs> Let us quietly wait and patiently endure the will of the Lord till he cometh. Our Father takes away the rod when his design in using it is fully served. If the affliction is sent for testing us, that our graces may glorify God, 
It will end when the Lord has made us bear witness to His praise. We would not wish the affliction to depart until God has gotten out of us all the honor which we can possibly yield Him. There are no doubt many other ways that God comforts us through His Word, but the last one I want to mention is He reminds us that our sufferings pale when viewed in the light of the joys that are awaiting us. Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ, that is the reproaches that came upon him for having faith in the coming Messiah. Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ of greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Why? Because he looked to the reward. Hebrews eleven twenty six. In other words, your first moments in glory, your first minutes in glory will amply repay all the sufferings and trials you underwent here. And they'll all just fade into insignificance. Now, all the comforts we've mentioned so far come to us through the instrumentation of God's word. We were asking the question, how does God comfort us? He comforts us through his word, but he also comforts us. If you're a believer, you already know this. He comforts us directly through the Holy Spirit who's present in our hearts. Jesus told his disciples, I will not leave you comfortless. Orphanoi, it is in the Greek, I will come to you. I won't leave you orphans, I will come to you. And how precious are those times when in deep affliction or grief, the Holy Spirit comforts us through his very presence in our souls. I, I experienced that when my father died, also in a car accident, Glenn, about uh, 20 years ago now. The comfort of God's Holy Spirit. The great uh, Puritan pastor William Gurnall speaks of the Heavenly Father who slips quietly in and leaves the sweet perfume of his comfort. It is his kind spirit that holds your head and calms your heart while the trial rages within. It is his pungent fragrance that keeps you from fainting in unbelief. What soul thus comforted could for a moment doubt the love and concern of such a parent? Many of you here have experienced that very thing in times of great sorrow. John Newton said, if I might read only one book beside the Bible, I would choose The Christian in Complete Armor by William Gurnall, the book we just quoted from. Jesus promised to send us a comforter who would abide with us forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. John 14, 17. Apostle Paul experienced great trial. Five times beaten with 39 stripes, three times beaten with rods, taken up as dead after a stoning in Lystra, shipwrecked three times, spent a night and a day in the sea, treading water or clinging to a piece of flotsam, various imprisonments in peril of robbers and perils of Jews and peril of false brethren, weariness, toil, sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, fastings, cold, nakedness, plus, he says, the daily care of the churches to which he ministered. He knew great tribulation, but he also knew great comfort. Verse 4, blessed be God who comforts us in all our tribulation. But I, I want to underscore this. Perhaps the most striking thing, at least to me, in these first few verses of 2 Corinthians, is that Paul saw that his comfort did not end with him. He viewed the comfort he received from the Lord as having the additional purpose of preparing him to be a better comforter. He was so in love with Christ, so caught up in his life's goal of being an instrument to bring others to faith and to maturity, that he viewed his own sufferings and the comfort that he received from Christ, not as ends terminating upon himself, but as a means to an end, terminating upon those to whom he ministered. He said, if we're afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, verse 6. If we're comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. He seems to be saying that all those trials, persecutions, afflictions that came upon him were intended to enable him to be of comfort and encouragement to the young believers to whom he ministered who would themselves endure great persecution and trial. Now let's underscore a couple lessons from these verses before we leave. 
First and most importantly, Paul wrote to the saints in Achaia, in southern Greece. Are you a saint? Are you a saint? Are you one of the sanctified ones? Have you been called out? Have you been separated from this world? Have you experienced the grace and peace that Paul wrote of? Secondly, you're living in a culture not dissimilar from that in which the Corinthians lived. Are you maintaining purity? Are you able to be in the world without becoming of the world? Or do you find yourself adopting the ungodly philosophies and the sinful patterns of the culture? Are you being conformed to this world or are you being transformed by the renewing of your mind? Thirdly, have you found the comfort of God in your afflictions? Or do you struggle and complain and murmur against God's providence? Have you learned as the Apostle Paul learned in whatsoever state therewith to be content? It's not wrong to seek healing when you're sick. Paul did. It's not wrong to seek help when your marriage is in trouble or to seek help for your family. It's not wrong to seek deliverance from whatever your present trial is. But it is wrong to doubt the Lord or deny Him or blame Him for your trial. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He Himself tempt anyone. James 1.13 And finally, you who have been afflicted or who are being afflicted, do you sense, as Paul sensed, a responsibility to be a comfort to others? You're troubled, you're comforted. Now, are you comforting? Have you lost someone dear to you? Are you comforting those who have lost someone dear to them? Have you undergone severe physical affliction? Are you comforting those who are undergoing severe physical affliction? Have you gone through the heartache of a prodigal child or the pain of divorce? It wasn't just for your benefit that you were comforted and upheld through that trial by the Holy Spirit. It was that you might help comfort others. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what a glorious thing it is to have the very Word of God to read, to meditate upon. And Lord, we believe that you are the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation. Lord, we see many ways in which you do it. But remind us, Lord, that that comfort was not intended to terminate upon us, but that we might be comforters of others. Help us then, Father, to be a comforting church to our fellow believers as they go through trials. And uh, Lord, once more, there be one outside of Christ here today. Give him or her no rest till he finds his rest in you. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.